Now, one thing I want to do just so I can get it on tape to begin with is, is your first and last name, just so I have that and I can set my level. So if you go ahead and give me that, your first and last name. Uh, James Clark. And it's spelled traditional C-A-L. C-L-A-R-K. And no E. Okay. No E. Everybody has a little yeah. different, uh, different aspect. Now you grew up where? You grew up at Florida? No, uh, grew, grew up in, in Pennsylvania. But uh, we spent most, uh, mo most of my family is all in Texas now. And they, that's where they, they settled, you know. I was brought up in Pennsylvania and uh, during the Depression, oh, wow. and uh, lived in a tar paper shack. And uh, did you ever, you ever see that uh, movie uh, Tobacco Road? Yeah, well, it was something similar like that when I was growing up. But this was, uh, and they call it Carry Hollow, but it was uh, a line of shacks, tar paper shacks, and uh, just plain poor people, you know, it was all on welfare. That's pretty much how everybody was, right? I mean, it was... No, there was some that lived in the city. They lived better, you know. Oh. How, do you remember where you were uh, when Pearl Harbor happened? Yeah, we'd moved, uh, we had moved to the city when Pearl Harbor happened. And uh, my brother was already in the service when Pearl Harbor happened in the Army. And uh, he was going to make a career out of the Army. He went in at a, probably 38 or 39. Wow. So I, I, I assume an older brother. Yeah. <laughs> and which branch was he in? He was in the Army also. And when they, at the time of his funeral, I, I, I had decided that that's what I wanted to take, kind of take his place, I guess. So I couldn't wait to get in. I couldn't wait till I was 18, so I went in and lied. And I'm not on this now, am I? Uh-huh. Oh, I am. Yeah. So I uh, lied my age and and went into service at 13. There was supposed to be another one that was supposed to be, uh, he was supposed to be 12, but went at Marine Corps, but I think he died here about six years ago, or seven years ago. So I don't know of any other one that's younger than, 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 I, than, than, than me that went in at that age, 13. I know there's some that went in at 14 or what have you, but not at 13. God, that's amazing, because I mean, you're just a little kid. No, I wasn't a little kid. Uh, I was tall for my age at 13. I was the biggest one in the classroom. And uh, I left the fifth grade or sixth grade right out into the Army. And uh, everybody at World War II, when World War II uh, was going on, everybody wanted to be in the service. You know, either the Army or the Navy or the Marines or the Coast Guard or something. Everybody was patriotic, which seems to have died out uh, in this this time, you know. Yeah, it's changed, hasn't it? Since the Vietnam War. But uh, World War II was, even though we had a ration, we had things were rationed, people were living on ration books. Uh, meat was rationed, gas was rationed, cigarettes was rationed, the women's nylon hose was rationed. A lot of stuff was rationed, but people, still had patriotism, you know. And they all uh, formed the, uh, the letter V for victory, you know, and, and uh, down with the foe and down with Hitler and Tito and, and people just uh, patriotic. So uh, it was almost uh, a, a sin to be uh, of uh, age to be in the military and you're not being in there. So uh, a friend of mine came to me and he said, I just joined the Marine Corps. Well, he was uh, 14. And I says, well, how did you do that? He says, well, I'm leaving next week for a boot camp. He says, I'll tell you how to do it. He says, go to the draft board up there in, the, in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, he says, and, uh, and tell them that you're uh, 18, but have it already figured out when you were born and everything. And I said, well, you have to have a birth certificate? No, you don't have nothing. Just go up and tell you they're drafting, he said. So I went up there and, and uh, they interviewed, you know, give me an application to fill out. And I put down my age is 18. And, and uh, <clears throat> they, said, uh, they said, well, 
you'll be getting a, a notice from us in a week. So in a week later, I got to go t uh, notice to go take a physical. So I took a physical with all these grown men, you know, down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at the old post office. And uh, <clears throat> next day, it was an all-day physical. And at the end of the physical, they said, you passed. And, and next thing I know, I got a, a, a thing in the mail that says, you are 1A and you're now drafted in the Army. I, dra I got drafted. So I got caught up in the draft, see. So then uh, I went to, uh, to uh, well, my mother, I had kind of talked her into letting me go because first she didn't want me to go. And then I explained to her, you know, we were having hard times, you know, just working out of the depression at that time. Then uh, I told her, it was, in a private in the Army, then the Nimdos was getting $50 a month. And I uh, encouraged her that, um, I said, hey, Mom, I said, uh, $50 a month. I said, I could send you home $30 a month or 35 and I will keep 15 and uh, have allotment coming home. And I said, I'll be all right and everything, you know. And uh, she knew that I didn't like school, and she knew that uh, I was kind of running with the wrong crowd, you know, playing hooky from school, really. And uh, so she agreed. She figures maybe the Army will do me some good. And uh, since my father wasn't home, my father was an alcoholic. He was in the Merchant Marines, and he's never home. And we never knew where he was, see. That's why we was on welfare. So anyway, I came from a large family, and uh, sisters, and I uh, only had one brother, and he died in the service. And, and then my sisters, uh, they started joining the, the service. They went into... You know, my sister went in the Navy. My brother-in-law went in the CBs. And uh, so then I, when I got uh, sent to basic training, I went to uh, Camp Walters, Texas. Now, Camp Walters, Texas uh, is probably closed now, but I think it used to be a helicopter center after the infantry uh, uh, center gave it up and uh, they weren't training uh, for infantry anymore. They had the helicopters took it over. But I don't know if it's still open now. But then, um, uh, it can't, uh, the basic training at that time is, was a lot more strenuous and more harder than, and, 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 and longer weeks than it is today. Today it's about eight weeks. Then it was about 14 weeks. And, uh, and uh, they really laid it on you, you know. 30 mile hikes with full field packs on. And, and all that kind of stuff, and going out in the field for three weeks and living in trenches and trying to get you used to, you know, war, uh, uh, getting you used to being in trenches and stuff, you know. So anyway, um, Marty Murphy, I don't know if you knew him or not, he's the most decorated soldier in World War II, and uh, he's from Texas, and uh, Texas boy, and he, um, he had just... Uh, he was over at another company than I was when he was taking his basic training. Uh, you know, he became a movie star after he uh, got out of the Army. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. He got a battlefield commission and everything. I was, I'm surprised you don't know about Audie Murphy. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> you can go down to Texas in the, in the Capitol building down there, and in the Senate chambers they have a great big picture, of, painted, uh, painted picture of Audie Murphy. Because he was a well, Texas boy, you know. So anyway, um, I uh, after basic training, uh, infantry basic, then I, I volunteered for airborne school, went to Fort Benning, and uh, <clears throat> stayed there about five weeks. Graduated from uh, uh, jump school, and then uh, <clears throat> I got my first leave home, and then I got uh, sent to uh, to uh, <clears throat> the New Cumberland. And uh, I went to a school there, a special school there that the Army wanted me to go to. And then uh, I went to Fort Meade. And then I got another, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> got another leave home. And uh, I bought, now, uh, World War II, you, you bought, when you were going home on leave, you buy a round trip ticket, train ticket. Everybody was going by train at that time. They wasn't, uh, 
flying like they do today. Everybody was traveling by train. So uh, I bought me a round trip ticket to go home on leave. And I was home on leave and met a real nice girl and uh, and uh, kind of fell in puppy love, I guess. And uh, my time was up and I figured, well, I'll just be a little late, you know, a couple more days. And next thing I know, I was about 10 days over. So I went back to the back to uh, my reporting station, and they uh, Fort Meade, and uh, they put me under arrest of quarters, and uh, they was going to court martial me for being late. And uh, I thought, my goodness! And it, then it dawned on me. I said, these these people aren't kidding around, you know. So uh, I volunteered to go. Where I said, well. I'm late and everything. I said, well, for punishment, why don't you just send me overseas? Send me to Germany or somewhere, you know. Put me, get me in the war. Not you, uh, you goofed up, so you got to uh, face the consequences. And I was facing court-martial. So my uh, attorney told me, you'd probably get, you could be sentenced to uh, five to ten years in Leavenworth. So I thought, oh, I just can't, I can't go through this, you know. And, and how old and, are you now? And I was 14 then, 14 and a half. And I said, well, look, I said, uh, I'm underage to my attorney. And I told him how old I was. And he says, boy, don't you wish you was. He didn't believe me. Say. And I said, I am. He said, well, if I, if you could prove this, he says, I'll give you, could hold off the court for 15 days, and you could prove this. He said, I can get you out of this. He says, but if you're lying, you're really going to be in trouble. <laughs> So I sent home to my mother and got her a, a, a nap a dated from her and a copy of my birth certificate. And uh, so they um, still had the trial. And uh, but my lawyer told the, ju the ju jury, and it was all military jury, that uh, this boy is a minor. He don't know his own mind. And then uh, the, the, the uh, judges at the court says, well, may uh, we can get him for fraudulent enlistment. And, and uh, my attorney says, no, you can't, because this boy didn't forge anything to get into service. Uh, it was a draft board's fault for drafting him and didn't ask for any proof <laughs> of his age at the time. So anyway, uh, they dropped the whole thing. And then they gave me an honorable discharge with all the uh, GI Bill and everything, you see. So... Um, Honorable discharge, and I was happy about that. So, but but I wasn't happy of getting back out of getting out of the service. It was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was be late. And uh, I came back, and I just didn't fit in. I came back out of the service, you know, and, and tried to take up where I left off before I went into service, and I couldn't do it because I was I'd been with older men, you know, older uh, men, and 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 uh, done adult things, you know, and, and, and been trained for war and throwing hang grenades and going to the rifle range and doing bayonet drill and all that kind of stuff and, and drilling with soldiers and marching with them. And and, uh, and I just couldn't adjust to the uh, uh, young kids my, my real age, you know. So uh, I figured I'd just strike out on my own. So... I hitchhiked across the United States on my thumb at 15 and and became a hobo. But uh, now being a hobo, there's a difference between a bum and a hobo. I found that out on the road, you know. And uh, a hobo would work his way, you know. He'll do odd jobs and what have you. But a bum, he won't. He don't want to work. He just wants a bum. But anyway, I hitchhiked across the United States, and I could thank the Salvation Army. They took. Uh, took me in each time I hit a big city, you know, they'd take you in. I did odd jobs from washing dishes to uh, on dairy farms to you know, chicken farms to just about every kind of work I could get along the way. And then when I uh, hitchhiked down to Florida from uh, New York, well, when I was in New York, I was working at Bear Mountain Inn as a, a busboy. I don't know if you ever heard of Bear Mountain Inn. It's up near West Point. It's a ski resort. Then after that, I took off for Florida. And I hitchhiked to Florida. It took me about 
uh, five days to, or six days to hitchhike to Florida from New York. And uh, I got to see all the states, you know, by being out on my own, Alabama and, and, and Georgia and all those, and the Carolinas. But anyway, uh, uh, when I got to uh, Florida, by this time the war was, it was, was just over. And uh, uh, I went to the unemployment office to apply for a job. And they said, well, what state are you from? And I, and I told them, you know, and they said, well, we don't have enough hard jobs here for our own servicemen in Florida. You know, uh, you just have to take what's left over, you know, and see us in a week or two. Well, I was, uh, had no place to live, so I was living on a park bench in Florida and in, in, uh, in Miami. Living on a park bench and, and going uptown to find a dishwasher job now and then. But then I landed a job with, um, they sent the unemployment office, sent me out to a dredge. You know, a dredge, you know what a dredge is? A dredge boat? And it was dredging the swamps in the, in the Everglades. And I worked on a dredge boat for about three months, uh, 65 cents an hour, 15 hours a day, and uh, hard work, very hard work. You had to stay aboard the dredge all, all the time. And uh, mosquitoes would carry you off alive at night. But anyway, uh, I uh, turned 17 on the park bench. I had quit the dredge job about in a, just about three weeks before my birthday, 17th birthday. And I went back to the park bench and um, turned 17 on the park bench. And I went up to uh, the Army recruiter and uh, told him I'd like to get back into service. And uh, he says, well, since you told me that you lied your age, at one time, he says, I, I'm going to have to have proof that you are what you say you are, you know. If you can uh, prove to me that, get a birth certificate and what have you, sworn up a David that somebody has known you all these years, that you are that age, I might get you back in. So I went up and got a post office box number, and I wrote home to my mother and had her send my birth certificate and what have you and permission to go in at 17. And she did. And uh, next thing I know, I would, took a physical, and, and I didn't have a, a rest record. I was good at that, you know, and I didn't get in any trouble from the time that I was in, got out of the service underage until the time that I went back in at 17. So that helped. So then uh, after I took a physical and everything, and uh, they uh, said, well, you won't have to take basic training. The rest of the group that I was, uh, that I took the physical with at 17 that was going into service, they all had to go to basic training. And he said that I would not have to since I already had been at basic training. That I would be going, uh, probably get sent overseas right away. So uh, they sent me to Fort Meade. And uh, next thing I know, I was on a uh, troop ship going to Germany. And I got to Germany, and the war had just been over, see. And... Uh, they assigned me to, um, after we got to Birmingham, off the, sh off the ship, and got processed, they uh, assigned uh, a few to Berlin. Now, Berlin was, uh, at this time, was uh, under a blockade for the Russians. The Russians had thrown up a blockade around Berlin. <clears throat> and we only had a, uh, what we call a small unit in Berlin. It was just uh, one regiment, and they had a constabulary outfit, and they had this uh, sixth, uh, the sixth infantry regiment, up in uh, Berlin, and uh, the Russians had it surrounded. And so when I got to Berlin, I went to a, a, a rifle company, and uh, it was pretty good duty. But then one day I was out uh, drilling. And uh, where a lieutenant came up to me from, I had never seen him before. He said to me, he said, I was on break. Uh, we, was, we had our company drill, and uh, then uh, we had a break, a 10-minute break, uh, at the end of the field, parade ground. And uh, this lieutenant came up to me and said uh, if I wanted to, if I was interested in joining, a, getting into an honor guard, that he was forming a new honor guard for the regiment. And... Uh, 
I told him, well, I don't know enough about it, but uh, I'll give it a try. So I um, got permission from the company commander, the, the unit I was in, and the lieutenant went in and talked to him. And he said he'd like to have me, so I went into the honor guard. And uh, we did fancy drills, and, and uh, we were always out at the head of the parade of the rifle companies, you know. And during the ceremonials, before the actual parade would would uh, pass a review, we had to do uh, 30 minutes of silent drill, you know, the, the honor guard platoon. And then uh, when the officers or whatever, anything big going on, why throwing parties or something, we had to be there to direct traffic or what have you and escort them into the doorway and what have you. And it was, it was good duty. And then... Um, uh, after I uh, left Germany, uh, I came back to the States, and the Korean War has, has just started up. And uh, I came back in 1951 uh, and uh, got sent to Indentown Gap, Pennsylvania, to retrain the recruits, because I'd made sergeant over in, uh, in, the, in the Honor Guard. I got promoted to sergeant in the Honor Guard, and. Uh, <clears throat> So um, when I came back to the States, at Indian Town Gap, training recruits, uh, it, it was getting hot over in uh, Korea at that time, so I got orders for Korea, and um, was sent to the 3rd Infantry Division in Korea up on the front line in the trenches. And um, I really don't like to talk too much about the war, you know. That's and. Uh, kind of gets to me, and um, after living in the trenches and eating sea rations and having body lice and, and, and all kind of bugs on you and not taking a bath for about three or four weeks, but sometimes they'd try to get us to the shower point. They had a shower point set up five or ten miles back of the front line, take so many off the front line by uh, after you walk about three miles to get on a truck take you back and get your showers. And then uh, during the Korean War that was never brought up, uh, <clears throat> they would give an issue us clothing that would, had uh, been saturated in, uh, in uh, DDT. That was to keep the bugs off you for a while. And so this was before they realized that DDT was bad for you. And but the, the clothes that they give you were just saturated with uh, insecticide, you know, DDT or whatever they put on it. And uh, it would work for a while until, uh, you know, you wore them for a couple months. That it would wear off, and the bugs would get on you. But we went on ambush patrols, and we took our punishment every night of artillery rounds coming in, and we got our casualties. And every morning we had to give a report of our dead and wounded. So uh, after um, uh, I got my uh, rotation from Korea, uh, I, w I was asked if I wanted to go to Japan or uh, to the States, and I took Japan. So uh, I uh, stayed in Japan for about a year at uh, Sendai, Japan. That's up in the northern part of Japan. A real nice little city at Camp Schimmelfenning. And uh, there I left, uh, I just got there, I just got to Camp Schimmelfenning when the 24th Infantry Division, one of their outfits was there, and they were going to, they were packing up to go to Korea, and I just left, and they assigned me to the 20th, to this unit. So I figured, oh, here I go again, back to <laughs> Korea. And they were going over to guard prisoners, uh, at uh, one of the islands over there, and uh, they were having trouble with the uh, all the uh, prisoners from uh, the North Koreans and the Chinese that were captured, and we had them in, in stockades. And uh, so uh, the, the, the commander called me in and said that uh, there was another two other guys, two had just returned from uh, Korea with me. And he told us that we didn't have to go if we didn't want to. That we would stay there in the camp, 
and be, and be a, a detached small unit they were leaving behind. So I stayed behind and because uh, I didn't want to go back to Korea, and uh, I didn't have to. So he gave us a choice. So uh, I decided uh, that I was getting, uh, and I found out that they were short MPs. They were they were recruiting for MP duty there at the camp. So I volunteered to go in the MPs, and I stayed in the MPs there almost the year that I was in Japan. And then. Uh, I got orders to come back, to go back to States, came back to States and got sent here at Fort Lewis, Washington to train recruits. And um, then I got, or, uh, uh, no wait, I didn't, I didn't go, go to Fort Lewis then. I came back to the States from Japan and when they were processing, um, the, this one guy looked at my records and he said, uh, "Well, we're going to process everybody, but you. You're going to we're going to hold you off. You'll be uh, the last one to be processed." He said, "I got I got a deal for you." So he wouldn't tell me what it was. So they processed everybody and everybody got their assignment. And he's, uh, you know, I got my interview and he said, "Well, we looked it in. My father was in World War One." And he was in, and then, and then, like I say, he was in the Merchant Marines, and he was an alcoholic. But next thing we know, he was in the Army in World War II. And what he had done, he came home on leave. We got to see him when he was home on leave. We were, in fact, we was on leave together. He was home on leave, and I was home on leave. And I was too young to be in, and he was too old to be in. He had lied his age, made himself younger, uh, so he could get in on, on World War II. That's how patriotic people were. Even the ones that served in World War I wanted to go into World War II, but they were too old, you know. But my dad lied his age and, to get in. Wow. But uh, <clears throat> uh, that's my story about uh, that's uh, amazing, Vietnam. That's, that's amazing. What, it, being a, you know, I still have a hard time imagining being 13 years old and being in this adult world because... I'm thinking when I was 13, you know, I was uh, still playing with hot little cars. Well, that's, that's what I told you when I got out. After being with grown men and doing men things, when I was 13 years old, now I'm not bragging about this, but at 13, I was in uniform. I could walk in any bar, sit up at the bar and drink with the best of them, and never be asked for my identification. My identification was my uniform. They figured if you was old enough to serve in World War II and, and, and get ready to die in a war, you were old enough to drink. So I could, I could go in a bar and drink with the best of them. And, <clears throat> but um, I never, I never act, when I, when I was uniform, I tried to act like an adult at all times, even when I was drinking. I always tried to act older than I was. If you start acting a fool, and, and then start showing your age, you know, and then you'd be in trouble. But uh, I never got in any trouble I wasn't, uh, other than uh, being late for re reporting in, but I never got any uh, uh, serious trouble, you know. But I, I did my drinking with the best of them, even with the older guys, I drank with them. I, uh, <clears throat> they would have US, uh, USO, uh, USO shows come in. Uh, uh, they had bring dancing girls into the service club from town, busloads of them, and they were 21, 21, 19, 21, 22 years old. I was dancing with them when I was 13. As a matter of fact, I even dated a couple of them, but they never knew my age. See. But uh, I remember this one particular time when my, my sister, she joined, when I went in at 13, she had went in the Navy as a, as a wave. And she got stationed in uh, Washington, D.C., working for the, the Navy, their Navy office close to the Pentagon. So anyway, I f finished my parachute uh, airborne training, and I got my leave home. On the way, by train, I got off the train in D.C. and uh, figured I'd surprise her. See? I had 15-day leave, so I was going to spend a couple days with her, or a day, at least a day. So uh, I found out where she was working. I had her address. So I went right to the where she was working. 
And I walked in this Navy annex building with all these waves working, these young, good-looking women, you know. Here I am. I'm about 13 and a half then. And uh, these, all these good-looking women. But I was in uniform. And uh, they showed, uh, somebody took me to my sister's desk, and she had her back to me. She was typing. And uh, the girl told her, somebody's here to see you. And she turned around and saw me, and, you know, happy uh, brother and sister would be at that time. And uh, so uh, she asked her boss if she could get off the rest of the day to show me around D.C., you know. And they said, sure. So some of the other girls from the other uh, desk start coming this way, you know. They wanted to, because I was, I was a soldier, and they were used to seeing nothing but sailors. So uh, she's seen them all coming, she, and she said, told them, back off, this is my brother. And, <laughs> and I said that, I said to, under my, you know, uh, quietly, I said to her, I said, well, introduce me to some of them. She says, I will not. She says, you're only 13 and a half. She said, if you think I'm going to introduce you to some of my girls, like girls that I have to work with at this office, and they're a lot older than you are, they're in their 20s. He said, if something serious went on, how could I explain this? <laughs> so she hurried up and got me out of there, and then she showed me D.C., took me up to Washington Monument and, and some of the other monuments they had there in D.C., and showed me all around D.C. Hey, you had a brother in the service too, right? Yeah, he. Uh, my brother was it went in nineteen, uh, in a thirty-eight or thirty-nine, and he was going to make a career out of it. And uh, nineteen forty-two, uh, he he contacted. Um, why was in the service? Why he was in the service? He got um, uh, leukemia, and uh, he died in the Walter Reed Hospital in Washington D.C. And. He was in the service. And uh, when, uh, at his funeral, I had already made up my mind that I was going to take his place. So that's the story. That's amazing, though, because the, uh, the amount of patriotism that you, you talk about that, that was in America at that time. Yeah. Uh, patriotism was really strong, and, 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 and uh, even kids would... Uh, take a, a dime or two to school to buy a, a stamp for the war effort. People were buying bonds for the war effort. Mothers were putting in uh, in their window a little flag, a little uh, cloth f uh, flag, and a uh, uh, real pretty little flag, and it had stars, big stars on it. Blue was for uh, how many stars, uh, ones that were serving. and. Uh, and then, then, then uh, gold for uh, wounded, and I think silver for, uh, it could be the other way around, was uh, killed. But everybody, just about every window you looked at down to, uh, in, in the houses had a little flag in the window showing how many stars they had uh, their, in their family serving or been killed or wounded. Because you, you were pretty, you were big for your age. Yeah. Were you mentally... An adult, or were you mentally a little kid? I mean, I got home. No, 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 I can. no, no. I, I, when I, when I, when I was thirteen, uh, I, uh, I was girl crazy, and uh, I hung out after we moved out of the country, and uh, out of the tar paper shack, and we moved to the city, and uh, close to the city, and uh, my mother got a job in a drugstore or what have you, and. and and my sister was working, and and I was hanging around with the guys over at the pool, over at the pool hall around town, and I always ran with uh, guys older than me. I never ran around with uh, my own age. They were either 16 or 17 years old. I was 13, 12 or 13. I always ran with around the older bunch. I went to dances, you know, went to go to dances, and uh, but kids my age weren't doing that. The other kids my age weren't doing it, and I always liked to uh, dress neat to go to a dance and everything. Hair slicked back, and you know, and uh, and a nice sport coat, and and looking nice, you know, to go did dances there. I was thirteen. I was doing that, you know. So when you got in the barracks and stuff, that you didn't have a problem. I didn't have a problem, and. Uh, 
And most of these guys, you know, World War II, they were drafted guys with five and six kids. They had five and six kids at home. Some were in their 40s, you know. They were in their 40s that were being drafted in. So in my, I never said down to them, you know, that I was 13. You know, but I, I, looked up, I looked up to them as a father figure, too, you know, as I went along with them and helped, you know, and did my training along with them, going on 30-mile marches and all this and that, you know, and went on all these courses. And, now, when I took my training in, in Texas in uh, July and August, it was hot. And guys were passing out with heat stroke that wasn't used to that down there. Well, I wasn't used to it either, but I never did have a heat stroke. And we were warned, like we was having a parade. When I was taking basic training, we was parading. If a man next to you passes out, you look straight at attention. You didn't see him fall. You look straight ahead, you're at attention, so you're, you don't render a hand, you don't do nothing. We have medics in the back of the company that stay in the back, they'll come up and take care of you. So you had to stand at attention, and here I was, 13 years old, maybe a, a guy passed out next to me, you know, and I just looked straight at attention. <laughs> or even when we was having classes, uh, different classes on map reading and stuff like that in the service, out on bleachers, out in the sun, no no overhead, no nothing overhead, out on a, outside in bleachers, and the sun beating down on you, you'd see guys passing out, you know, from heat stroke down you, in Texas. You were a paratrooper. Yeah. At Fort, at, I, I took my training at Fort Benning. And, and at, at what, 13, 14 years Thir old? Well, I was 13 at Fort, I was 14 then, yeah. Jump out of the plane. Yeah. Kind oh, of yeah. got qualified. Yeah. But now when I graduated from uh, uh, basic training and went straight on, some of those guys were after basic training, they went home on leave. The guys who volunteered for parachute training had to go to parachute training. Then you go home on leave. And that parachute training, well, I'll tell you, it, 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 it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't rifles and stuff, you know, because you already had that. It was physical. You know, uh, double time and, and push-ups and physical training. And uh, out on, uh, <clears throat> in the, excuse me, Fort Benning, they had a place what they call the fry pan. It was a lot of sawdust. And these guys would get up on these platforms with their shirts off, and you'd have your shirts off, and they'd say, before you leave here, you'll hate your own mother just like I do. And, boy, they'd lay it on you. Push-ups and, and exercise, you know. And, and then uh, before breakfast, run five miles before breakfast, and then come back and eat breakfast and go out and run more, and then do some more exercise. And everything you had to do was on the double. If you moved, if you was on a 10-minute break and a water fountain was out in the middle of the parade ground, you had a double time over there and double time back. And why you'd keep your feet moving while you was drinking the water. And then we packed our own parachutes and everything, too, at that time. I don't know what they do at all. Did you ever think when you got in there, <clears> oh, my <throat> God, I just want to be a little kid again? Or No, no, no. I, I, I loved it. I loved the service. That's when I when I when I when I goofed up and was late and got thrown out of the service. You know, thrown out, but I got an article. I was I was just devastated. I just couldn't fit in. Who? What was I going to do? I couldn't fit in with my my grade, my my uh, <clears throat> age. I couldn't go back to the sixth grade. I didn't want to go back to the sixth grade. So I that's when I struck. I, well, I got that job on the river, on the on the paddle boat as an oiler. But then, too, uh, I wasn't really satisfied with that because that put me 10 days on, five off. And I'd be 10 days away from being, uh, away from girls and going dancing, and <laughs> you know. I was on there with older men on this boat, but uh, I wanted to go out and dance and jitterbug and, and, and go dancing and go out with girls, you know. That 10 days on a boat was just killing to me. But I was making good money, 10 bucks a day was good, yeah, with room and board. At... Uh, uh, it was a good time, though. Uh, so, then, so then when I uh, struck out on my own, I got, I got another education. You know, I was, on, I was on my own. I was not a follower. You know, I didn't follow somebody else. I made it on my own. There was times, the days, that I didn't even know where I was going to get a piece of bread or a bowl of soup. And here I was, 15 years on the road, 15 years old. Now, my mother didn't know I was doing this. She uh, she thought I was uh, uh, 
going to go. Uh, she, I told her I'd land a, a good job in Florida, and I had uh, got I had a nice room and everything. But I was living in the park. You see, and I didn't want to worry her. And uh, while I was hitchhiking to get to Florida. In different states, I went to New York and worked up there. What it's like to Florida. I, um, uh, like I say, the Salvation Army took care of me. They would uh, each town. They'd give you a place. They let you take a bath, give you a place to stay in a bunk, you know, a bed. They would feed you. And every town, they'd take care of you. And uh, but I just didn't depend on them either. So I I, I worked my way. Doing odd, any, any kind of gesture. I'd be hitchhiking and some farmer would pick me up. And I'd ask him if he needed an extra hand. Why, sure, yeah, I could use an extra hand. I've slept in guys' uh, barns, slept in the barns, and help them uh, do uh, farm work. Huh. And it doesn't sound like you ever sat idle. I, uh, I've slept under bridges with, uh, with, uh, with hobos. That, uh, that's all they wanted to do, though. They, uh, they just wanted to be a hobo all their life. I didn't, uh, but I didn't. I was, I was going to stay. I stayed with them and, and act like a hobo, but I didn't want that to be my life because <clears throat> I was too young for that. And a lot of them would set me down under a bridge, you know, around a fire and cooking a, a pot of uh, stew. Anybody that had anything they, they to donate to the pot, why they would, you know, a couple cans you have in your backpack or whatever. But them hobos always slept close to railroad tracks, you know, and they knew exactly what time, what train was going to come through there and where it was going. And I didn't, I didn't want to do that because uh, I'd get on a train on a boxcar and I don't know which direction it's going. And they do, they know where they're going. But I, I, I only rode the train one time on a boxcar and, and it, didn't, it didn't go the direction I wanted it to go in. So I didn't, I got off and I, I got on the road. I could look at a map, and I knew where I'm going. Uh, hitchhiking, <clears throat> at those times, people didn't mind. And in the 40s, people didn't mind picking somebody up because it wasn't all this uh, uh, crime that, uh, and dope that there is today. You know, all the time that I was in the service, up to the, up to the Vietnam War, up to the Vietnam War, I didn't even hear of dope and marijuana. I never, I never even knew what it was, and I didn't. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, when I got to Vietnam uh, as a, as a civilian, when I was over there as a civilian, and uh, we would uh, uh, dock when I was on that survey boat, we would dock into the the port of uh, of uh, Saigon. Now Saigon was a sin city, you know. A lot of GIs that come out of the jungle and that they wanted uh, a couple of days rest and. Bar girls, bar girls were plentiful. <clears throat> but anyway, I walked in a couple bars in Saigon. Uh, it, the, 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 it was just saturated with marijuana smoke. And uh, it, it was just terrible. And uh, I wouldn't even go in a place like that. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, it was dangerous in Saigon for civilians and GIs both. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when I was in Saigon, uh, working as a as a civilian, there was a lot of civilians there, and, and, and that was our main office. Well, when we pulled up to the and dock at the port of of, of uh, Vietnam, uh, we'd go up to the main office. And we got to know everybody that was working around the main office, and, that, and they were they were living them civilians were living in villas in Saigon, and, that. and some of them had their wives over there. So anyway. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, as a civilian over there, 